just tell you some of the things we're going to talk about with Dr. Rob Linstead right on his own website at BibleTipNow.org, BibleTIPNow.org. Reenactment of the water libation held to prepare for the third temple. You say, why? Why, why do we care, Brandon? Because this is going to probably be the tribulation temple, which gives us an idea of where things are setting up for on God's <clears throat> prophetic calendar. You know, the Bible tells us these things are going to happen. Don't confuse what God allows with what God approves of. There's God's perfect will, and then there's his providential will, what he allows. Bible prophecy tells us there's going to be another temple, and the Antichrist is going to be involved in that temple, right? Look at this other headline. Hundreds of Jews visit Temple Mount on Election Day. Here's one I'm always interested in this topic, and that is, Red heifer sacrifice could take place in one year. Really? Red heifer sacrifice could take place in one year in Jerusalem. Plot of land on Mount of Olives has been purchased and is ready for a valid sacrifice. The first since the destruction of the second temple. Things are moving fast, folks. Which means we may be out of here. Because, again, if you hold, depends on what eschatology you hold to, but if you hold to a eschatology, an end-time eschatology that the church is raptured before the tribulation, then I guess the only thing now is for the rapture of the church. Maybe you hold to a pre-tribulation rapture. Maybe you hold to a post-tribulation rapture. Maybe you hold to a pre-wrath rapture, which means we go through about 75% of it. But regardless of your eschatology, uh, on the when the, the rapture happens, uh, we're lining up. Now, for those who hold to the idea that there has already been the rapture, that's a preterist or a partial preterist. Hmm, that's weird. Uh, or how about the, those who believe all mill, all mill, all millennial, we're just going to roll into the kingdom of God on earth. How's that going for you? How's that working out for you there, Kirk Cameron? How's that working out for you, Kirk? Kirk Cameron and all the others that uh, uh, ridicule the dispensationalists and those that believe in the rapture of the church, you're going to Christianize the nations and uh, get enough Christians elected to office and usher in the kingdom of God. How How is that uh, reconstructionism working for you, Gary North, Gary DeMar? How's that working out for you? When are you going to realize that's not what the Bible teaches at all? The Bible tells us there'll be a falling away from traditionally held biblical truths, the apostasy, that perilous times will come where uh, the faith will wax cold for many. They will be surrounded by a great deal of false teachers who say what their itching ears want to hear. I, don't, I mean, it's incredible what these people come away with. I mean, if they can't study the Bible, can they not at least read the newspapers and realize what's happening and it doesn't fit with their eschatology? The problem isn't with the Bible. The problem is with their interpretation. The problem is with their interpretation. They're not studying the Bible correctly. They're not using good hermeneutics. That's what differentiates a dispensationalist from these other groups. You use the same set of rules over and over to, con to interpret the Bible. B the Scriptures confirm the Scriptures. Scriptures interpret the Scriptures. And uh, clearly we've been interpreting them correctly. I was talking with my mother the other night. And I remember as a child that she and my father took me, along with my siblings and some friends, family friends, to see Hal Lindsey's movie, The Late Great Planet Earth. The Late Great Planet Earth. Remember that? <clears throat> some of you are old enough and uh, to remember going and seeing that. Some of you are older than I am, so you clearly remember. I was just a little feller in elementary school when I went to see The Late Great Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey. I was also discussing this with my mother the other night in regards to what's available today that was not available to us many years ago. I remember going to a Christian bookstore in the Northern Virginia area outside of D.C. in the 70s. There weren't a lot of Christian bookstores. There were some, but there wasn't a great deal. And I remember going in there, and, and there were not a lot of the resources available then that are available now. There were Christian bookstores in the early 70s, but not like they they're ended up becoming but go back into the 50s and the 60s, Christian bookstores, Christian publishers, even Christian radio in the 1950s and early 60s. 
there's really just been this explosion of Christian publishing and Christian radio and Christian broadcasting and Christian bookstores in my lifetime. And much of it has been driven by, wait for it, dispensationalist. Dispensationalist. Many of your broadcast networks and pub, Christian publishing and Christian schools and seminaries came through people that were dispensationalist. They understood the Bible. They understood the times. And they looked at what was happening in the world through the lens of the Bible, starting with the Bible first, not starting with the newspaper. And because they understood what was happening and there was such a limited amount of resources to educate people on this, they began to write books and produce movies like Hal Lindsey's book, The Late Great Planet Earth. That really opened the floodgates for more people to publish, more publishers to, to start publishing companies, more people to write for those publishers, more documentaries and movies and conferences. But go back to the 1950s and the early 60s and try to find someone teaching on Bible prophecy, uh, well, it wasn't that common. It was not that common. But now, of course, it's it should be as clear as the, the nose on your face that the things that these guys were writing about and talking about are now coming true. When will some of these folks that have mocked the dispensationalist, when will they repent and realize uh, we were wrong. Now, we can argue on when the rapture is going to happen. We can argue pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, pre-wrath. We can argue all that. But can they not see that this idea that we're going to somehow Christianize the world and roll into the kingdom of God on earth by us doing it, reconstructionism, social justice, it's not going to happen. In fact, that's what the Bible, the Bible says it's not going to happen. There will be a millennial kingdom, but it's not brought by man. Jesus told his disciples in the book of John, my kingdom is not of this world. It's not from here. If it were, my disciples would fight to keep me from being turned over to the Jews. God brings his kingdom, Daniel 2. We don't build it. God brings it. That doesn't mean we roll over. It doesn't mean we're apathetic or passive or pious because we're called to occupy till the Lord returns. But many of these people are holding to an eschatology that has been clearly proven now wrong. Many of them should have started to question their eschatology just with the fact that Israel came back. Those that want to say God's done with Israel. Well, that's funny. This little nation comes back into being in May of 1948. What are the historical odds of that? And everything the Bible says about them is coming to pass. And we even have now their enemies lined up on their border in Syria. There you have. Inside Syria, you have Russia, and you have Turkey, and you have Iran. And what are they threatening to do? They want to wipe them off the map. Literally, their maps don't hold Israel to be a nation. Now they've been flush with, well, with, with treasure, natural gas, oil, who knows what else. But then again, many, many, many people to this day within Christendom are mocking well, let them keep mocking. They are actually a sign of Bible prophecy being fulfilled. And as we've said before, so many of our churches will not touch this topic. They will not touch the topic of Bible prophecy. They just ignore it. We're going to talk about the red heifer sacrifice. It could take place in one year in Jerusalem. That's what this website's reporting. Again, now, this is exciting to me because it shows me Again, maybe soon we're going to get out of here. How many of you are ready to get out of here? How many of you are ready to be done? How many of you are, are uh, tired? <laughs> you know, the Bible says not to become weary and well-doing. We're trying. We're trying, but we are so ready to go. And I look at these signs and I say, oh, good. Oh, good. Maybe we can get out of here. Even so, Lord Jesus, quickly come and night shall be no more. Maybe we can get out of here real soon. So I look at these things that are happening and I understand them in the context of the Bible. And for me, it's not doom and gloom. Hi, Rob. Welcome to the broadcast. Hi. Yeah, thank you. Good to be with you. I don't know how much you and were hearing what I was saying about uh, Bible prophecy and meeting a guy from Ukraine on Saturday at a restaurant, prayed a beautiful prayer, started talking to him. He's sitting real close to us. And, and the people that were hosting him were from a Presbyterian church. 
he's from a Baptist church. And we began to talk Bible prophecy and the, and the, and the dear sweet people who traveled to the Ukraine 60 times uh, to help with an orphanage. And so I commend them and they're, uh, and they're just wonderful people who seem to love the Lord and, and, and the gospel. But they were completely clueless as to what we were talking about. In fact, the wife turned to the husband and said, he's saying what so-and-so says. I said, well, who is that? Oh, that's a friend of ours. And they're, you're quoting mm-hmm. Ezekiel 38, 39, just like they do. Yeah. This was all completely foreign to them. Why, why, would, why would that be foreign to some Presbyterians? Well, I think in your, in your introduction, you talked a little bit about dispensationalists. Yes. And, and I am one. Me too. I, I believe that uh, I believe that the Bible is laid out in a very orderly fashion. And, and uh, what I find, I, I, I run a, a Christian school, and I find that the kids who come from backgrounds where they don't believe in dispensations, they're almost confused by the Bible. Yes. And, uh, and so one of the things that I've done to, to talk about how we understand where we are is you, you have to understand the overall plan of God, the overall plan of God has dispensations. Matter of fact, when people tell me they don't believe in dispensations, I say, well, I know you believe in at least two. And the reason I say that is because how many of them went to church this past Sunday with a lamb? Because if you don't believe in dispensations, you should have brought a sacrifice. And so the fact that they didn't bring a sacrifice, a a lamb or a bullock or a goat, it means, well, they must believe that you don't have to do that. So when did that stop? Because clearly, that's what the, the Jews did. That's what the early scriptures demanded of the Jews. So the fact that they didn't bring a lamb that says, okay, we believe in at least two dispensations. But the thing, and they always say, yeah, but it says that God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so sometimes I try to explain it this way. As we go from one president to another, to another, to another, we didn't change the Constitution. But, but the the president changes, the administration changes. So the basic rules are the same, but the, the individual ideas within those, those administrations can be quite different. And so as you look at dispensations, how could people, let's say uh, in the garden, in the age of innocence, the dispensation of innocence, how could they be responsible for the law when the law wasn't given yet? Or what does it mean when it says that Christ fulfilled the law? And so certainly right now we're in a different dispensation than we are, than let's say we were under the law and, and under the, the conditions of, of Adam and Eve. And so if people stop for just a moment, they see, yeah, there are different dispensations. I go to the point that I think that when they begin the tribulation, those rules are different than under the church age because those who receive the mark of the beast, there, there's no salvation offered to them. And so that's the only way to to really put an intelligent understanding of the scriptures. And I think today part of the confusion is because the idea of dispensations, in other words, studying the entire word of God, that's one of the things that that modern preachers today don't want to do. Brandon, just this weekend, I, I met with some people and they were frustrated because in their church, they begin to say that the first 11 chapters of Genesis are a fable, mm. maybe an allegory. And, and so they said, <clears> you know, do you believe that it's, I said, I, I believe it's the word of God. I, I think every, every important doctrine in the Bible was introduced in Genesis 1 through 11. I believe in the front of the book, Genesis 1 through 11. I believe in the back of the book, Revelation 1 through 22. But they said, how come our preachers telling us, okay, don't study Revelation. It's only going to confuse you. Don't study Genesis 1 through 11 because that's going to cause arguments in, with your, your uh, professors. Wow, have we gone that far away from God's word? They don't see that, that God wrote to us a word that the canon of Scripture is intact from Genesis to, to Revelation. It's one message from God. It's one God. It's one message. So it's our job to understand it, to study it, and to understand it. And today, people don't want to take the time to study it. They would rather ignore it. And I think that's getting the church in big trouble because they're ignoring major sections of the Word of God. And part of that has to do with with Bible prophecy. And part of it has to do with with how we 
how we it came through in terms of creation and what happened at the flood and the destruction there. These are important doctrines, and no wonder people are confused today. Yeah. Well, the, 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 the good news is they were very interested in what I had to say, what their guest had to yeah. say. They were very intrigued. Very, I, and, and again, I commend them for their love of the gospel, their love of helping people uh, over in Ukraine with the orphanages and 60 trips to, to Ukraine and bring people the gospel. Uh, but I felt sorry for them, to be honest with you. I felt sorry for them. I thought their, their leaders, their church leaders have let these dear people down that they don't even understand mm -hmm. what's happening. And, uh, but how interesting that immediately I could find fellowship and camaraderie with a man from Ukraine who just touched down, and we found that over, A, our Christian faith, and B, Bible prophecy. Fascinating, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's great. You know, as a person looks at this election, uh, you know, I guess we could be discouraged because we didn't have a, a red wave. We, 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 I don't even know if we had a, a, a pink ripple. <laughs> but, 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 you know, the, the thing that concerns me the most, it's this. Is it really true that roughly half of America doesn't care about the issues that were so important? Religious leaders gather in Sinai to receive climate justice Ten Commandments. The article says religious leader, and this is dated November 7th, November 7th, where's the date? There's a date on here, I just saw it. There it is, November 7th, 2022. November 7th, 2022, from Israel 365 News. Yeah. Religious Boy. leaders gather in Sinai to receive climate justice 10 commandments. Some 40,000 attendees have flocked to the Sinai desert, in, 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 including over 100 world leaders, as well as leaders in business and other acts, sectors, Christian, Muslim, Jewish, and other religions figure, religious figures will participate in a UN conference on climate change that is taking place this week and next. In conjunction with the UN event, a group of faith leaders is taking an alternative approach, seeking a faith-based solution to ecological crisis, promoting the 10 principles for climate justice in a global initiative. And it goes on to talk about how they are calling for climate repentance ceremonies. On Sunday, this, on Sunday, the organization called will hold a climate repentance ceremony. Dr. Linstead? Well, I'm, I'm not a bit surprised because <laughs> I really believe that as we, as we look at the end time, here's what the Bible indicates, that, that we're going to move away from, from the Bible, we're going to move away from God, and we're going to become obsessed with, with His creation. Romans chapter 1 states this. And, and I'm going to be honest with you, I wish I was at that climate change conference because I'd like to see who's there, and I'd like to hear the ridiculous things that they're putting forward. I, I really, well, isn't it amazing that these people that, that talk about climate change and how we're making such a, a carbon footprint, how do, how do they get to this conference? My guess is they flew in on jets. Some a of them lot of them private, jets. yeah, private jets. Yeah. And so that has no carbon footprint at all, huh? <laughs> I mean, it, it, see, the very thing that they're preaching against, they're doing. So they don't really believe this climate change thing themselves. We move quickly to red heifer sacrifice. Could take place in a year. Let's hit these as fast as we can. We've been watching these red heifers. Five of them come out of Texas land. We've showed the video of them being offloaded off the plane. Fascinating. Now they're coming out and saying they could be sacrificing within a year. Now, wait a minute. I thought the red heifer sacrifice was to purify the temple. Are they talking about purifying a tabernacle as a temporary place? Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's look at the order of things, because once they determine that these red heifer are suitable, in other words, they, they pin them up, they, they make sure that they're, they meet the, the rules of, of purification, then what they would do is they would cremate the animal. And before they cremate him, a, a her, it's a her, uh, they would take and they would build a, a clay pot called a calile. Then they cremate it. They put the ashes into this pot. And those ashes are used in a ceremonial way. Uh, so if somebody needs to be purified, maybe it's someone who's touched someone who's dead, or maybe it's someone who has a, a particular disease on the skin and they want to make sure they're, they're clean. So they have to go outside the, the wall. They have to be outside the city, typical to, to all rules of cleanliness in Israel. And there, after they're inspected, water and ash mixed together would be, would be put on them. And now the priest is unclean, the rabbi is unclean, and those people are allowed to go back in if they're pronounced clean. 
But I think another thing that we, we've overlooked sometimes is that here's what happens. Once the animal is, de is determined to be uh, meet the specifications, the first thing that will be put into practice will be the Sanhedrin and will be purified. Next, the priest will be purified. And then, and only then, can they begin the sacrifices that the Bible talks about. And so, so there's really kind of this order that will be followed. Once that occurs, then I think they, you'll begin to see an even bigger push to do sacrifices on the Temple Mount. And speaking of that, you couldn't name a more controversial thing than to say, let's do sacrifices on the Temple Mount. Because right now, those, the Palestinians, the, P, uh, the PLO, the Palestinian Authority, the PA, they say that any Jew on the Temple Mount is actually an invading Jew. They call a Jew on the Temple Mount invading. A man was arrested because he played a shofar sound on his cell phone. He didn't even have a shofar up there. And, and so. And who arrested that, him? That the, the PLO or Israel? No, the PLO stopped him. The Palestinian Authority stopped him. Now, because they don't want a major conflict on this at this moment. The Israeli government has actually prohibited several people that I know from going up on the Temple Mount. Here's what the Bible says. I was, I was just reading in the book of Daniel this weekend, and in Daniel 10 and 11, when Daniel was confessing his sins, actually it was chapter 9, he was confessing his sins, and he talked about how that God said, you know what, I want to purify the city of Jerusalem. It, that's not true. That hasn't occurred yet. Okay. Next he says, I, I want to purify the temple, and I want to purify the mountain of God. The mountain of God, that's what the Mount Moriah is called. That's where the temple mount is built. And so the Bible talks about the process that that will take. And among the things, you see, Israel, they want so bad to do sacrifices and prayer on that temple mount. They, they have rabbi, a, a little rabbi that they think might be the Messiah. All those things initiate as they begin to sacrifice and as they begin to, to worship on the Temple Mount. Isn't it incredible that really for the first time in almost 2,000 years, people in Israel are excited because they say, now is the time for this scripture to be fulfilled, Hosea chapter 3. And I believe that the Antichrist is going to make a promise saying, okay, we're going to let you do that. I'm going to guarantee you peace and safety. You set down your weapons. You stop your, your violation. The United Nations, I hope we get to talk about this in a minute, is still in Israel. They got to stop, uh, they got to get rid of their nuclear weapons. Huh. Well, when, when they make a promise, you're going to be able to go back up there. They're going to set down their weapons. It looks like they're going to have peace. And that's when the Antichrist again will double cross Israel. And he's going to say, I changed my mind. I'm not going to let you sacrifice up there. I, I changed my mind. I'm not going to give you access to, to this temple area. And that's when the Antichrist erects an image of himself and requires everybody to worship that and, and get a mark of a beast so they can buy or sell or trade. You know what? I've watched in the last two years the world conditioned to where we are willing to take a mark, to purchase things, to, to go to work, to, to put our kids to school. Ten years ago, I would have said, I, I think people are too smart for that. They're, they're, the Antichrist can't trick them. Huh. Now I've changed my mind. I, I think that they will say, yeah, we'll do that because, because we, we want to bow down to whatever we got to bow down to because we're going to eat, we're going to have jobs. Even if they know what he's saying is a lie, I think they're going to be willing to do it because we've just swallowed a bunch of big lies and we just keep thinking somehow it's going to get better. It doesn't get better. So let me ask you, I got, I got to go to break. Do you think they can start doing a temple sacrifice for a tabernacle? Is that right? Yeah, I think a tabernacle, a temporary building. I think the temple is going to come later. The tabernacle was a temporary building. They could erect it within hours. I think once they get permission, I think within hours they're going to begin sacrificing. Wow. So they can start sacrificing within a year for the third temple, but it'll be a temporary tabernacle while they wait for the temple to be built. That's fascinating. Um, how, let me ask you a quick answer because I got more I got to get to. How would that fit in with the rapture? If you do, you believe? I mean, if they went to a temporary temple mm -hmm. and started making sacrifices, could that happen while the church is still here? 
It could. You see, the, the thing that, that really allows the tribulation to begin is the confirming of a ah, treaty mm. between the Antichrist and Israel. And, and it's interesting, Daniel 9.27 says, the leaders of Israel. So the Antichrist is going to make that treaty. And I want to go back to that idea of, of a treaty in just a moment. But the thing that uh, happens for the church is we're, we're raptured. Yeah. So to be honest, uh, the beginning of the tribulation is not dependent upon us, other than we know the fact based on Revelation 4 and Revelation 6 that the church will not be here. Matter of fact, I think that things will continue to get so bad that God's going to say, I don't want my bride, I don't want the church to be a part of this, because he said, I'm not going to have my wrath here. You know what? God has every right to have wrath on, on the human race. Here we are, we're rejecting the true commandments of God, and we're taking climate change commandments to protect uh, an environment, and we're not even protecting it. We're, we're pretending like we are. God, God has every right to be offended. So look what he did to Israel, his earthly people. What he did, he had to discipline them. And so he, he, he allowed them to be taken into to Egypt at one time. He allowed them to be taken into Babylon one time until there was this repentance. I look at the world today, and we thumbed our nose at God. We're, we're, we're saying that his Bible is an allegory on one, on, on one end of the scripture. We're saying that, that uh, Revelation is a, a book of imagination, that some of it's been fulfilled. This is ridiculous. A, a child can read it and take it literally and understand that we're living in a time when these things are, are being fulfilled exactly as the Bible said. And so the Bible said in the last days, Israel would come back as a nation. Here they are. The Bible said they'd be in the land. Here they are. The Bible said that all the world would turn against them. I must have 20 articles that show the anti-Jewish movement in the world is greater than it's ever been. Even the United Nations continues to pick on Israel. Now, think of the threats that, that Iran has made. Think of the threats that, that Korea has made and that China has made even toward Taiwan. You know what? If Israel made a threat like that toward any one of their neighbors, believe me, the United Nations would, would go crazy. And so the United Nations just told Israel, get rid of nuclear weapons. That, that's ridiculous. Iran has nuclear weapons. Other neighbors of Israel has nuclear weapons. So why can't Israel have nuclear weapons to protect themselves? Believe me, Israel's nuclear weapons not only preserves Israel's place in the Middle East, protects them from an invading Iran, also protects them from an invading Russia, because Russia is supporting the nuclear development in Iran. Mm. We, we are the most gullible people in the world if we don't think that Russia and Iran are working together. Indeed they are. Here's my you, yeah, go ahead. Well, yeah. you're gonna, go ahead. Here's my concern. Right now, Israel has just stated in the last week or so, if we continue to see the development of nuclear weapons in Iran by Russia going into helping them, then we may have to do something. Now, a couple of years ago, Israel did a couple of things to slow down the whole process. They they scrambled their, their computers, and, and Iran was stalemated. That was, for, called, that was, uh, that was a, a thumb drive. That w they put them all of these thumb yeah. drives all over the Middle East, hoping they'd take them into the, the uh, lab there in, in nuclear program and spun up their centrifuge just so they, so they blew apart. Su uh, it, Stuxnet. It was, Stuxnet. Yeah, it was, it was wonderful. <laughs> it was <laughs> wonderful, <laughs> yeah. And uh, so, so isn't it strange that they can threaten Israel and, and the United Nations doesn't really care. But when Israel says, no, we have, we have nuclear weapons for our defense, and, and let me just tell you this, the United States would not be safe without Israel's nuclear weapons. I, I, there's days that I think Israel is what's keeping America safe at all. Hmm. But can you see a scenario where if we're not careful in the world situation, I can see Israel having to stop Iran. Now Russia will be involved. So it puts not just Israel against Iran, but also Israel against Russia. Here's my concern. I'm watching people that say that we ought to get involved with the Ukraine even more. They want us to, to loan them all kinds of, they want Israel to, to give them the Iron Dome. <laughs> we, we know the Ukraine is crooked. 
we know it's a, a money laundering development. But do you see that if we're not careful, we're going to have a war with Russia on both the Ukraine front and on the on the Middle East front? And I I tell you what, we will not fare well because right now, the United States of America is not prepared for war. No, we're not. In China fact, the Heritage the Heritage Foundation came out and said we are very very weak militarily. Before we uh, conclude in about two minutes. Let me ask you about this headline. Reenactment of the water libation held to prepare for the third temple. What is this? <clears throat> well, during the, the Temple Mount process, and, and it's an exciting time, there's the water of libation. Uh, if someone wants to look at it, they can study John's Gospel, chapter 6, and I believe that's uh, there was a water libation. And that's when, when Jesus said, you know, I'm the living water. And... Uh, and it's always interesting because whenever Jesus says, I am, he answers it. He, he's talking to a blind man, and he says, I'm the light of the world. And sure enough, the, the blind man now has vision. And he, he talks to a lady at the well, and he says, I'm the living water, and, and she, she gets water. And, and he talks to a hungry mother, he said, I'm the bread of life. And he talked to, to Mary and, and Martha, and he said, I'm the resurrection of life. And so Lazarus comes to, to life. So Jesus is the I am. And that's how God introduced himself to, to Moses. He said, I am that I am. And so it's an identity of God. It shows that God is active in these things. So this, this celebration of libation, here's what it shows. Israel is getting ready for sacrifices on every side. Animals looking for purification. The, the feast and the preparation of libation, the instruments, all these are in place. But I believe that before the real uh, sacrifices goes, the Antichrist will be here and make them secure so they can go up on the Temple Mount. If so, we're gone before that happens. To me, the worse it gets, the, the brighter my hope is that Christ is coming soon. <laughs> exactly. Amen and amen. <coughs> Dr. Rob Lind, excuse me, Dr. Rob Lindstead, his website, Bible Tip Now, Bible T I P Now dot O R G. Thank you, Dr. Rob. My pleasure to be with you.